So I think I'd, I'll start out by just giving us a little orientation of um, exactly where the Coastal Studies Center is, uh, for, for those of you who might not be familiar with Maine or Coastal Maine. And um, of course you're going to be able to see the site, which is probably a really neat part of your trip, and um, you're going to be able to kind of take in everything out there in a way that's going to make a bigger impact on you than probably my talk. So. Um, after I show you where it is, I'll just give you a little outline of what we're doing and then I'll open it up for some questions and then of course you're going to see a lot more today, which is very exciting. Hopefully the sun will come out, but even if not, it's uh, not freezing, so that's good. <laughs> okay, so where are we? Um, we are uh, in coastal Maine and actually um, we're in a very interesting place because uh, this body of water is known as the Gulf of Maine, traditionally a very, very cold um, a body of North Atlantic water, part of the North Atlantic Ocean, but also traditionally very productive, right? The founding of, of really the United States was partially dependent on the productivity of this, of this body of water and below because the colonists essentially ate fish for a long time. So extremely important historically um, to uh, the United States. And just to zoom in a little bit, try not to make us seasick, so um, the little white dot there is on the Coastal Studies Center itself. Um, and as I, as I move in, um, right here, we're on a, a, an area called Casco Bay, which is, uh, includes, um, here's Greater Portland right here. And then if we keep coming in and in, here you are in uh, Brunswick. Um, and you can kind of see from the dot that uh, the Coastal Studies Center is essentially down on one of these long granite fingers um, that have been uh, formed by uh, the last glaciation. Uh, and it's about, but it's, it's um, I guess it's both close in a way. It's about a 20, 25 minute drive from Brunswick, um, but it's in its own town, uh, the town of Harpswell. And so if we zoom in even further, you can see that um, this uh, peninsula here, and that peninsula is actually the property of the Coastal Study Center. So it's a fairly large uh, area. It's 118 acres of land. And you can, the other great thing you can see from this map is that it's mostly all trees. So it's actually had um, very little development uh, over its history, which is now in over 250 years. Unusual for this part of Maine um, because essentially, um, as you can see, just driving a lot around a lot of the uh, coastal property is worth a lot of money and, it's, and there's a lot of development pressure on the land. So the first part about the Coastal Studies Center is we're very lucky it's a very special place because it essentially um, is a place that is in a, is in a great natural condition. And um, if I go in a little farther, if I zoom in a little farther here, so now you can uh, really get a sense for um, some of the, the forest that surrounds um, the property. But in the center, you'll see this cleared area. And actually, um, that's the footprint um, of a farming history that goes back about 200 years. So that land was originally uh, cleared for uh, grazing for animals like cows, um, sheep, and pigs, but small numbers. We're talking about a, a small New England farm. Um, 12 to 20 of each one of those animals. So not super large, but with that number of animals, plus the productivity from the surrounding ocean, you could essentially make a decent living in New England, and, and that's how the original uh, founders essentially did it. Um, one thing also to keep in mind in New England, or particularly in Maine, is that our soils are not the best. So you really had to fish to make a go at it um, here in New England. In fact, um, before uh, Western uh, colonization, um, basically our, our Native American groups were essentially hunter and gatherers and a lot of the food protein they, they um, uh, got was, it was extracted from the ocean. The estimates are about half, 50% of their protein came from the ocean. So the ocean's a very um, important part uh, of, of um, the history of the land and, and essentially the sustenance of people who have colonized this, this place. So um, I'll now very deftly move into keynote, <laughs> Mike. Um, Ta -da. Okay, <laughs> definitely. And uh, I'll definitely start this keynote presentation and um, I'll show you a few, a few slides. Uh, just an opening photo, uh, this is actually our, our research pier. It's a shot right from the coast to see that we've got um, uh, 
a, a beautiful coastline, but also quite a bit of it. We've got about five miles of coastline that surround this peninsula. So the access to these environments is really good. This is one of the ways we access them too. It's along pier. We've got um, several boats that you'll see um, to get out on the water. But let me back up a little bit. So I will tell you a little bit about the history of the land itself, um, a brief history actually. And uh, as I mentioned, um, we're over 250 years old. So the first families uh, that came and worked the land was the Weyer family around the 1800s. It's hard to figure out exactly when. Um, and actually the Weyers were uh, adopted children of um, Joseph Orr. And you're gonna be traveling to Orr's Island. So he was the, one of the first major landowners um, in, that, in that region and in the town of Harpswell. Uh, so they worked it for about 87 years, a couple of generations. Uh, after that, um, we have the, the Hansen, the Hansen family. Uh, he came from uh, Denmark, um, bought the farm, essentially kept it, uh, uh, kept working it for about, uh, was that about 50, 60 years there. Um, again, a pretty small uh, farm, uh, but like I said, a small number of animals. Uh, and uh, um, after the Hansons, we've got uh, the Winnowet Weiser brothers for about 10 years, and then eventually we get to the Talheimers. So in that first period from 1800 to 1952, there's only four owners of the property, right? So it just gives you a sense of um, there hasn't been that many people that have really um, worked on this land. Uh, our story here at Bowdoin College really starts in, in 1981 when um, a family who owned it briefly at the, at the end of that period, um, the Talheimer family, actually deeded the land to Bowdoin College. Um, one of the Talheimers is actually an alumni of Bowdoin, uh, and they just basically gave it to us, which was, was great. Um, not much happened for about uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, the college was really, um, they did use it for recreation as a natural site, but they were trying to figure out, well, you know, what should we do with it and what should be its future? And um, to start that future more as a place, uh, a, a, an academic center, um, enter the Bean family, uh, Leon and Lisa Gorman, who gave a really nice gift in 1995, $2.1 million to start what we call the Coastal Studies Center, a place where um, students could, could come to study the, the, um, uh, the ecology and the natural landscape, as well as um, do laboratory and experimental work by building some facilities there to, to help that, um, those activities. So that's really the start, um, that donation. And then three years later, essentially the Coastal Studies Center was dedicated. So some of the infrastructure that you'll see there was essentially built in that three year, three year period. In fact, all the major pieces you'll see out there were built and dedicated in 1998. We've had some other things that have helped us out um, in this history. 2005, 2006, um, the research pier that I showed a photo of earlier uh, was put into place and that was done in, um, in essentially two stages, one with a, a grant from uh, the National Science Foundation uh, as, um, that was uh, written by the former director. And secondly, a very generous uh, gift from an alum, uh, Jeff Rusak and his wife, Allison Wrigley, um, helped essentially put that pier uh, and the pump house into place. Uh, and so that's really great. And then um, if we, so that's what I call the farm to field station period. I've got a name for um, the new period, and that's uh, uh, basically field station to climate change center. And so this period, I guess, really might begin with me. Uh, in 2013, I was hired as a director, and the idea was to move the station into a new phase of growth. You know, how can we perhaps expand the capabilities of, this, of what we have at the station? How can we bring more outside um, folks to use the station? Um, how can we perhaps build new programs for our Bowdoin students so they're really uh, engaged in this natural place and they're doing, uh, you know, they're working on relevant problems, studying relevant processes uh, to um, essentially our new century. And uh, we've done a few things even in, in this, I guess, fairly, short period of time, I was thinking, oh yeah, I've been here for two years when I was putting this presentation <laughs> together. Um, and we've done a few things in that two years, which is really great. We've actually um, been through a renovation of the Marine Lab, and uh, uh, you'll get a chance to see that today. Um, we've added quite a bit of uh, sea flowing seawater um, capabilities. 
for the marine scientists, the flowing seawater is, is really the lifeblood for, for much of the work. So it's important to have a good system and a system with a variety of capabilities. Uh, so we added to that. We also added a separate dry laboratory space, which you'll get to see, where students can actually use things like microscopes. Um, they can use other kinds of equipment that need computers that aren't going to be affected by the seawater. And that, it's a, not a huge room, but it's a big, it's a big thing for us just because it adds a classroom right next to the flowing seawater um, that our students can use. And then most recently, um, NSF has told us we're, that we're, I guess I'll say we're very likely to get money for this experimental seawater laboratory. We're working on some of that paperwork right now. So we're actually going to build a little more capability into the marine lab um, to study things like uh, the effects of climate change on marine organisms. So, um, so yeah, it's pretty exciting and uh, it keeps us all busy, I suppose. Um, the future from here, uh, we do hope to continue developing um, the, the property in a sustainable way. We'd like to add some more um, capabilities for on-site residences um, so students can actually live on the property as well as um, visiting researchers in the summertime. We also would like to build some more uh, teaching and research capability in, in terms of a second um, laboratory building. So we do have plans um, to, to add to it. And uh, um, I said sustainable, to, so to do that, we're actually going to have a master plan for the entire property, because you'll see it's all a thing. It's really all one big organism, really. And so we have to think very carefully about what we do um, in, in the future. And that is part of the deed. The Telheimers did want it preserved in its natural state. Um, it's part of the charter of the Coastal Studies Center. The Gormans also uh, wanted it to be used sustainably, so that you know that's a path that, that we certainly have to follow. Okay, so what are you going to see out there? Um, these are horrible photos compared to <laughs> uh, being there and actually being on site, but I'll just tell you a little bit about why it's such a special place in terms of natural environments and the natural world. Uh, it's got very nice uh, rocky intertidal. Uh, so that's the uh, uh, habitat between the tides. It's got hard substrata that things grow on. Um, uh, marine biologists dream in many ways. But even more dreamy is the mud um, that surrounds the Coastal Studies Center. So the, to the uh, marine scientists, they call that soft sediment. You know, uh, I, I'm a soft sediment biologist or I'm a soft sediment scientist. You can just translate that into I, I get in the mud quite a bit. <laughs> So there's an enormous amount of biology, though, in that mud. Um, uh, large organisms as small as microbes doing very important ecological things, but also as massive you know, as, this, as the wading birds that use the muddy habitat, other large uh, fish, and even sometimes marine mammals that come in really close to the shore. So it's a very extensive habitat in, um, in this part of mid-coast Maine, uh, and a very ecologically important one, and we've got plenty of it, as you'll see. So, and if the tide is out, you'll get a chance to smell it as well, which is really important <laughs> part of marine biology. We also have subtital seagrass, more difficult for you to see in unless you jump into the water. It's going to be cold if you do that today, but, you know, by all means, if you feel like getting in there, you can actually see seagrass. Um, and uh, so that's uh, the marine picture, but we also have um, quite a bit of forest. Uh, we've used that a little bit from the Bowdoin side in the last uh, 20 years, the, the terrestrial habitats. But there's a lot of opportunity there to bring other folks in who could um, study. Uh, a it's basically a spruce fir um, and a little bit of hardwood system, as you'll see. Um, um, but uh, we do not log it. We don't really manage at this point. So it's really a system that's just left um, to its own. And it's been doing that really for the last 120 years because the, the Talheimer family um, did not uh, log it either. So uh, um, that's an interesting potential to center. And we've also got these former agricultural fields. Here's the one that's behind the farmhouse um, that you'll get to see when you, when you get on the site and you actually look at the farmhouse. One fact I'd love you to keep in mind is that um, Mr. Hansen cleared this by hand. It's over 10 acres. So he pulled, took every tree off it, pulled every stump, and moved every rock to the side. And no one has uh, done any expansion on it since that time. So just to give you a sense for what was going on in that time, you know, what, how much work needed to, to to be done just to, to make a living as these people did. Pretty remarkable, so just something to keep in mind. Um, facilities, what are you going to see? Well, um, we've got some uh, uh, nice uh, facilities for uh, doing science. So um, the wet laboratory, or we really call it the marine laboratory, and it has different components to it now because we've renovated it, is uh, really one of the, the centers of the property. Uh, it's the component that has flowing seawater, about 700, 1,700 square feet. We've got a, um, we pump seawater up from the pier 
every day of the year, at least we try, the sound isn't frozen over, um, at a fairly high rate, 100 gallons per minute. So you can just take a look at this, the systems we've got there to do that, but it's technologically complex to keep that going. But again, um, it's really the, um, the most, one of the most important resources for marine biologists is that access to that water. And, it'll, and it comes about 100 feet uh, up from the water to the uh, wet laboratory. Um, so we've got to pump it that distance up the hill from the pier, and you can kind of see that too. Below the research pier itself, I showed you a photo, uh, about 40 meters long, got great um, uh, docks for boats. Uh, our scientific boats are out there, and you'll get a chance to see them. We also host the sailing team um, at Bowdoin, and so they've actually got a big float on the right-hand side that you'll see. That's a fairly new thing. Uh, actually, it's only, they've only been at the Coastal Study Center for a year, but it's another activity that we do out there um, that really adds to the center. Uh, they're they're um, uh, a really great group of people. Uh, we have regattas out there, families show up. Um, it's a nice uh, an additional dimension, recreational dimen dimension to the Coastal Study Center. Um, down the sound, we also have some interesting technology. The department here, Earth and Ocean Science, how am I doing for time? Okay, uh, that's fine. Um, Earth and Ocean Science uh, maintains a buoy out in the sound, and that buoy is basically helping us monitor the environment um, as it changes over long um, and long temporal scales. So there's some other technology floating around there too. Uh, you will get a chance to see um, the farmhouse is really one of our, our classroom and living spaces. It's basically uh, exactly as it sounds, a renovated old farmhouse, but it's fairly uh, 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 very cozy inside. We have a terrestrial lab too that's kind of off the grid. You can wander and check that out. Um, that's basically solar powered, so it's not connected to the, to the main lab. Um, I'll just finish by mentioning that uh, the um, Location that we have in coastal Maine is really a great place for climate change research. And why is that? So there's a couple of reasons. And the first is, as I mentioned earlier, um, we are in the Gulf of Maine ecosystem. So here we are, a little red dot. Um, the Gulf of Maine is this, is this area here, mostly blue and a little bit light blue. And so the thing to know from this, um, this graphic is this is all warm water here. This is all cold water here, so this is actually a biogeographic boundary. So a lot of organisms like this temperature. Gulf of Maine organisms like the cooler temperature. And what's happening with climate change is this boundary is moving northward. This is a, um, data from the summertime. You can see the, Gulf, the southern Gulf of Maine is really warming up. And as climate changes, it gets even warmer. So we're right at that boundary. So we're at a transition um, that gives us a chance to actually see um, as these southern organisms move more, uh, northward, uh, by the Coastal Study Center, um, we become like a sentinel site um, to, to observe that, those processes. The other important thing to know, and I'll throw a little bit of more data at you this morning, I guess it's 9 o'clock, that's okay. Um, this is a prediction of what's going to happen in the ocean in the next century. And it's a neat um, model because uh, in this case, um, Camilo Mora, who's actually, I knew when I was at the University of Hawaii, a really great guy, um, he's integrated all these effects, temperature, changes in oxygen, negative changes to pH, negative changes to productivity into one measure and projected them onto the Earth's, a map of the Earth's ocean. The red is the hot spots, right? So that's where you're going to get the most negative change um, in those variables. And what you see is right up there where we are in the North Atlantic and the Gulf of Maine is one of the most severely impacted places in the next 100 years. So that makes it really um, uh, a crucial place to uh, study the impacts of climate change just because of, of, of this kind of phenomena that will happen in the next 100 years. Um, the final thing I guess I'll say is that it's also, uh, the site is an opportunity to study um, other human impacts. And really when I say other, I mean things like overfishing. Uh, so I, I mentioned earlier the colonies were essentially founded on very productive cod populations mostly, but other fish too. Now all those stocks are, are, are in decline, which has both uh, impacts in other parts of the ecosystems, but we also want to know well, what can we do to mediate some of these problems. And I love this photograph because this comes from Harpswell Sound. This comes from very near us uh, in the 1930s. Here's a bluefin tuna. 
that was caught right off, uh, basically in the water surrounding the lab. That's not a bad size one, right? It's probably, you get sashimi from that for what? At least one barbecue or whatever. Um, and they were considered trash fish back then because they ate and chased around the other <laughs> albacore and things people were interested in. But these big pelagic fish um, were coming up into Harpswell Sound um, and, and very abundant at this time, of course, no one's seen a bluefin tuna in, the sound, in Harpswell. And even in the Gulf of Maine, it's hard to find bluefin tuna. So, so um, we're in a system that, that's strongly impacted, but that presents opportunity for us, our students, to understand the impacts. And not only that, what can we do um, about those impacts? All right, uh, you can ask me a little bit more. I guess I do have one more slide here. Um, I did, until I keynoted myself out. Um, Sue mentioned we're running a program a, a semester, and we are starting a semester in the fall called the Bowdoin Marine Science Semester. Um, we may have a few of these flyers kicking around. If you're really interested, uh, we'll, we'll give you one. So this is a program that's going to use the Coastal Studies Center uh, as a place to actually teach in um, on a daily basis. It's going to be run uh, for the entire semester, but it consists of four course modules. That means uh, we teach one course at a time for about three to four weeks, basically um, you know, the entire day. Uh, so it gives students an opportunity to be at the Coastal Studies Center, but also to immerse themselves in the process of science, uh, to really uh, think deeply about a subject for a little while anyway, and then switch to another one. And so we're excited. We're, we're starting this, as I mentioned, fall 2015, and I think it'll it'd be an interesting new dimension to the Coastal Studies Center um, in this uh, decade. So I think I'll stop there, and then uh, if there's time, I'll, I'm happy to feel questions. <laughs>